Hello. So uh, this is a talk about developers demanding UX for Kubernetes with a bang at the end, because it's very important. Um, my name is Mo Duffy. Um, oh man, is it not going to work? Uh, is it because I'm standing over here? Let me see. OK, my fancy thing doesn't work, so we'll do it the old school way. Really? Oh, no. Well, OK, I got something. And is it going to go back and forth? OK, cool. All right, it's working again. OK. <laughs> anyway, my name is Maureen Duffy. I'm a UX engineer at Red Hat and um, work on the Prodman Desktop project. And here's Connor. Yeah, my name is Connor. Uh, I was a student of software development at the time of uh, working on this uh, report here that we're going to talk to you about. So uh, I interned with Red Hat. Uh, this is one of the projects I took on while I was interning. Um, since then, I've been uh, gotten a full-time position with Red Hat. I've been employed. So, but uh, yes, at the time, uh, I was just an intern. And we are KubeCon newbies, so, so be gentle, OK? Yeah. We also feel a little bit like outsiders because we're UX, but we're bringing kind of a fresh outside perspective. So also be kind. <laughs> OK. Not that you wouldn't be, but OK. So. What did we do and how did we do it? So for three months, we did a user research study. It completed this past December. We talked to 11 participants. It was a combination of developers and platform engineers who support developers who work with Kubernetes as a deployment target. Um, we recruited through the Podman desktop community and full disclosure, the reason we did this research was to inform a new Kubernetes feature that we just launched in Podman Desktop. Um, yeah, and most of the interviews were video calls. They averaged about 45 minutes a piece. Um, we actually scheduled them for 30 minutes, but, you know, because we put the bang in the t talk title. Like, they actually literally did demand better UX for Kubernetes, and they went long. So the participants were very enthusiastic. This is a list of the participants we talked to. You'll see there actually are a lot of Red Hatters. Um, what ended up happening is we reached out to the Palm and Desktop community, and um, just based on scheduling issues and time zones, we, we wanted to make sure we had at least 10 participants, so we kind of reached into our internal community as well. And um, this is sort of, we had a range of experiences that we talked to. The average of, um, the average participant had two to three years experience with Kubernetes. On the low end, we talked to a platform engineer. He, um, he worked at an ML company that supported data scientists that not only had no Kubernetes experience, but they had no infrastructure experience either. So that's sort of like the low end of experience that what we talked about captured. And then on the high end, these are red hatters. Um, somebody from since 2015 and somebody since 2016 had Kubernetes experience. So we had a, a pretty good range in the participants. Okay, so now Connor is gonna talk you through our research protocol. Yes, so we had 16 questions in total for the uh, developers that we spoke to and the platform engineers as well. So these 16 questions, uh, they related to different topic areas. So their environment that they work with, uh, their workflow, general workflow, uh, their approach to debugging, and also any recurring issues or pain points that they experienced. Uh, if anyone would like a copy of the full research questions, you can click the link there or the QR code, but I'll just go into them in a little more detail at the moment. And please, please reproduce our research, talk to your own users, and let's share the results. Yes, so there, uh, there was a couple of questions. I won't go through all of these, but just to give you a quick uh, insight. For example, we asked them, in terms of the environments they work with, we asked how many Kubernetes environments uh, their organization maintains and what kind of environments they are. Um, we also asked how, how these uh, environments are created and um, questions to, to that effect. So then in terms of their workflow, uh, one of the main questions we asked was what primary tools, CLIs, and components they use, how they utilize them in their standard workflow to walk us through it, and uh, just also whether they prefer CLI or uh, GUI tools. Um, we also asked if there are any particular challenges or difficulties that they encounter when writing Kubernetes YAML files. Uh, most of the answers to this question began with yes. And then just for general issues that they would encounter or pain points. Um, so we asked them to describe their general uh, approach to debugging issues, including the tools that they use to aid them in the process. 
um, where they go when they have questions, and also how they approach debugging issues that um, are only reproducible in production um, very carefully. We also had an additional questions section. Uh, you may notice there's just one question there, but that was because this was the final question that we ended on. Uh, so this uh, gave them an opportunity, it was a bit of an open question, and gave them an opportunity to uh, talk about a couple of things that maybe they felt weren't mentioned along the way and uh, allow them to kind of continue and say whatever they were itching to say along the way, so. Yeah, so then the methodology, so this is uh, how we analyzed uh, the interviews basically once we had completed them. So we performed an infinity mapping exercise and categorized findings uh, from the interviews. So basically we went through uh, the transcripts of the interviews and we found, we extracted the main points that the developers mentioned and we then categorized them into separate categories such as uh, workflow and debugging in the overall category of the workflow that we mentioned. So. Yes, um, so with that then, uh, we're going on to the next section. So this is how can Kubernetes provide a better experience for developers? And I'll hand you over to Mo. Where we can, we, uh, we provide some suggestions as to what we think could be a good way to address. Maybe the community has already addressed it and neither us or the developers we spoke to were aware that's an opportunity to maybe better promote the projects because I know you guys are the experts, right? So if we point something out as an issue the developers surface to us and you're like, oh no, Project X will solve that. Well, promote Project X to developers, okay? That's like a takeaway I want you guys to get. Maybe we don't know about the technical solution to something that was raised to us. If you do, help, help promote it to developers to help our ecosystem, all right? So yes, this quote, I hope you guys were reading it while I was blabbering. Um, this was a kind of an interesting quote that one of the participants said. Um, we have a range of um, experiences that we talk to with Kubernetes. So some of the more newbie to Kubernetes developers, I mean, generally they expressed a lot of intimidation. And I don't know if that resonates with anybody in here when you're first starting out trying to learn Kubernetes as a developer. There was a lot of intimidation. This was a quote from somebody who was more of an expert user, but he said, you know, it's beautiful when it works. I totally get it, but when it's broken, <laughs> it's so hard. So that's sort of like the, even an experienced user is kind of coming from this perspective. So, yeah. so the first issue then, uh, this was debugging networking issues. So I'll just talk a bit about this. So this emerged as like a, a large uh, pain point among the developers. They all had some kind of uh, experience with this. Um, and especially networking issues that occurred between, uh, in the gray area between uh, Kubernetes and infrastructure layers. So the main thing that they mentioned is that there's limited visibility into networking layers, uh, particularly in cloud environments like AWS, and there's also a lack of proper metrics, so that makes uh, debugging uh, networking issues uh, quite difficult for them. Um, they mentioned that this is especially the case among developers who are unfamiliar with container network interface configurations, uh, so those who are uh, a little bit less experienced find this, uh, in particular, extra daunting. Um, and the general approach that they take uh, in situations like that is just to deploy to a different zone um, to assess reproducibility. They feel like there isn't really uh, any other approach that they can take. Um, another point that was mentioned is that uh, there is a complex relationship between different networking options, such as the Kubernetes default option, uh, KubeNet, and the private Azure CNI. And a lot of developers said that they uh, are, are unaware of the intricate relationships between these sometimes, and it can also uh, cause uh, unexpected issues. So one particular example that was raised is that if you use the Azure CNI overlay, um, that it may restrict the use of the application gateway for ingress. Um, and then on the note of uh, network topology, so while, the, while these issues are rare, while network topology issues are rare, such as how the VLANs are trunked, that was one thing that was mentioned in particular, um, when they do occur, troubleshooting in production is often necessary. And uh, they mentioned that in this case, all you can do again is just to set up a mimic environment and hope the problem is easily reproducible. And uh, a note on this uh, nice quotation here, if you hear hoofbeats behind you, assume it's a horse, but if it's a zebra, proceed accordingly. Uh, that's kind of the reaction that the developers will have when they realize this is a network topology issue and this is something that I'm going to have to uh, address uh, in production. And we listed this as number one because I think 
pretty much everybody we talk to cited network issues. So it's number one for a reason. It seems to have the biggest impact. Okay, so number two. Now, we're going to have a theme going on. YAML. I, I hear laughter, so I think you, you get where we're going at. This one's pretty easy. Basically, YAML is human readable, but the spaces and indentation matter. Um, it's very hard with the human eye to review a file, especially when you know, you're on the hook to fix an issue, like, oh my god, we need to figure out what's going on here, and you're looking at it, and it looks fine, looks fine. Passes the lint check. Something is indented wrong, it's misconfigured. That, that was something that people surfaced as th this is a continuous problem. Um, and it's something I think has been a problem with Kubernetes configuration for a while. Um, it seems to impact developers a lot. Um, we had some suggestions, you know, could we develop a tool? Has one been developed before? I don't know. Um, that would maybe give you some sort of preview before you commit the new YAML. Could it give you a preview of what it's going to do? So before you push it, you would get an idea of the impact. So if you did have some indent that was broken, it would let you know. Um, you know, like reliable previews of Helm and customize output. That was something a couple of people said, like, you know, in a dream world, if you could have what you wanted, what would you ask for? That's what they asked for. Um, also, the various ways values can be stacked and added to, to objects before the application of the template. That was another thing that came up. Um, so that's, that's the thought here. So now on to the next YAML theme. Yes, so the next one then, this is a lack of proper YAML validation. This is something that the developers raise as well. So they, they feel that this is a significant issue. Uh, they feel like the tools uh, for YAML validation, uh, they're not uh, integrated with, for example, the custom resource definitions uh, that are found in clusters. Um, so if you have a CRG for Tomcat, this is one that was specifically raised, um, the YAML validation tool, it won't be able to validate the YAML unless you import the Tomcat CRG into the tool first. Um, they also mentioned that many, that this is something that the platform engineers we spoke to uh, mentioned, but they said that many of the organizations, they have resources created without the proper GitOps mindset uh, in mind while they're creating them. And um, they mentioned that this is a problem too, because if automation is part of their continuous development pipeline, uh, there isn't a viable tool to generate GitOps YAML files uh, that they can run Git version on and then reapply to other clusters as a baseline. So some of the recommendations uh, that the developers have said, themselves said they would like to see, uh, they would like to see a tool, a reliable tool for family validation, uh, which accounts for custom resource definitions and it uh, takes into consideration as well GitOps principles. Um, so this is a tool that could potentially be incorporated with the previous tool we mentioned for uh, indentation. But what they would like to see is the a tool that will can, can validate the syntax and structure of YAML files to ensure they're valid, be integrated with custom resource definitions to, uh, that are defined in clusters, and also generate GitOps YAML files that can be version controlled and reapplied to other clusters as a baseline quite easily. Number four, and this is the third and final YAML series developers complaining about Kubernetes feature. And by the way, there's eight of these. We're halfway through. I know these are dense slides, but there's a lot that the developers told us. Um, so this one is when developers are exporting YAML, it kind of has a lot of tags and labels and annotations and timestamps, but otherwise it may be the same as another YAML, but because of those little minute differences, two YAMLs can seem like they're different or they're applying to different types of things. Um, something that multiple of the developers we spoke with said, it would be so nice if I could just export a clean copy of the YAML that doesn't have all these little bits in it so that I can have a better, clearer view of what the differences and similarities are in the environment. And again, it's one of those things where I think by default, Kubernetes is very chatty. I, I get it, I'm very chatty too. But when you're new to a platform like this and you're just getting started, it is a fire hose of information. And I think that's why on the whole developers kind of express this intimidation. So I think this is one maybe easy way if we provided a tool to export clean YAML, 
It would make it so that only the differences that really mattered, they would stand up because there's less, there's less, I mean, this is a general UX principle, right? The less information you have when some, you make an alert for something or you highlight something, it stands out so much more because there's less than it, that it's competing with, right? So if we had some sort of export clean YAML feature, then those little bits like the timestamps and the tags and the annotations that don't really matter won't add to the noise and it'll help the developer hone in on the bits that they should be paying attention to. Um, and, and that is exactly what we suggested here with a little bit more details. Um, and again, like inadequate export functionality hampers the development of a comprehensive single pane of glass. That's what I'm talking about. Some way that you can just get an overview and what surfaces to your attention is only the stuff that really is different. Yes, and then another uh, issue raised by the developers was a uh, feeling of uh, inadequate uh, security analysis uh, tools. So they mentioned that uh, security analysis tools, they often generate warnings for non-issues. Uh, as they tend to check the library versions on base images. So this was raised as like a really big problem because it causes desensitization to these warnings. Uh, the developers will sometimes uh, anticipate that a warning is, is a non-issue and then that makes it easier for the real serious uh, issues uh, to be missed, basically. The Kubernetes that cried wolf. <laughs> exactly. Um, so the, despite efforts to address security vulnerabilities, um, this was another thing that was mentioned as well. Uh, many builds on artifact.io uh, have these vulnerabilities in them. As, and this is partially as a result of that desensitization to the warnings, uh, where, and only the critical alerts get the attention that they deserve in cases like this. That's a feeling among the platform engineers that we spoke to. Um, another issue, this was also mentioned by the platform engineers. They said that uh, a lot of the developers there are unfamiliar with differences in application security at runtime and at rest. And then this leads to unexpected vulnerabilities appearing at runtime too. Um, and one thing in particular they mentioned as well, uh, this is something that the developers said that they feel uncomfortable with. Uh, they said that certain security analysis tools like Rocks CTL, uh, they require you to push the image to the registry before you can scan it. And uh, they feel that this uh, risks um, inadvertent pulls of those insecure images and is a security risk in itself. So the recommendations that they had for that was to basically just have a tool in place that's capable of displaying information on the fly, uh, even during development that can provide uh, timely insights into issues that are as they are occurring. Or uh, they would also like to see the security analysis tools uh, just refined to improve accuracy, reduce false positives, they would like our developer awareness to be increased around security at rest versus at runtime, and uh, also to have a, uh, enhanced tool integration and workflow to minimize the need for uh, registry images before scanning. We got three more. Are you guys okay with the demands? Is it too much? Okay. Come on now, come on, be, be happy, be, be responsive, please. We're very nervous. Um, so number six was crash back loops. Um, this probably won't be a surprise, but it's a little bit hard to debug a thing when it crashes so fast that you can't actually take a look at it. Um, accessing logs during crashback loops is one of the biggest things that hinders troubleshooting. And actually in one case, um, inconsistent log visibility across platforms, that one, the developer actually said, you know what, OpenShift actually has this really nice, and I'm not saying this because I work at Red Hat, by the way, it has this really nice thing that lets you view the log when you're in this situation, but it's not on a screen the developer anticipated. So the entire time he was in this trying to figure out what was going on, he figured out that he could scroll down on this one page and access this log, but it wasn't where he anticipated. He anticipated it being on the events page. So that's another where it's, we're kind of almost there, but it needs a little bit of refinement. Um, the other thing that we actually talked to our friends at Sneak at the Expo Hall and, and verified this with them. If you're like me, you prefer to use container files. And um, some, some of, when, when you're using Sneak in certain configurations, it will only check Docker files. And if the file extension is container file, it won't check it. Oops. Um, so that was something that one of the developers surfaced to us. Um, is there anything else that I missed, Connor, that was worth surfacing um, no I think I think you covered it 
Yeah, so um, our recommendation, again, is a tool. I mean, designers got to design, right? And the idea would be something that lets you, that's specifically designed to resolve crashback loops that are triggered at this specific problem. Um, when a pod is in, stuck in a crashback loop, maybe stop it from doing that instead of letting it do that over and over again. Um, have a user-friendly interface for troubleshooting. Maybe surface those tools, like for example, the log file tool that the developer didn't even know was there. You know, maybe when you detect there's a crashback loop happening, surface that to, you know, so just-in-time contextual assistance for the user. When they're in that situation, you detect they're, they're in that situation, you provide them the tooling you've made to help them out of it. And then, um, yeah, options for creating debug containers within pods, letting the users SSH into the pod because they just, they feel more comfortable having an SSH prompt to tool around. I certainly do when things are going wrong. So, all right, next one. Yeah, yeah, so we're on to the CLI versus uh, GUI debate. So the participants had some uh, things to say about this as well. Most of them preferred um, the CLI, of course, but they still feel that there's a lot of room for improvement with the GUI. Um, so especially for inexperienced users as well, uh, having a refined GUI uh, can make the, everything seem a lot less daunting and it can uh, avoid scaring away uh, new talent basically as well. So um, one of the interesting things that came along uh, for the platform engineers we spoke to, they said they will often have to uh, provide remote support uh, to developers and those developers, they, they will not be able to share their screen. So trying to guide, especially if the person you're trying to guide uh, is unfamiliar with Kubernetes, is unfamiliar with infrastructure in general, trying to guide them through a GUI when you can't see what they can see, uh, that's a very difficult uh, thing to do. So that was a, a, a massive pain point raised among the uh, platform engineers that we spoke to. Um, so the requests on that part from the developers and the platform engineers was to basically just refine the GUI interfaces to accommodate various uh, experience levels, um, enhance uh, interactive troubleshooting features within GUI tools as well, and uh, also ensure that GUI tools, they offer clear status indicators and alerts uh, for better visibility into cluster health and performance, because that was something that uh, the developers mentioned that was the strength of the GUI tools, being able to see at a glance what the health is like of a cluster. So they would like more, uh, more of that, basically. Okay, so the last one, are you ready? Are you bored? Is this helpful? Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> so, the last one is basically just our grab bag bucket of just general issues that kept surfacing up over and over. And I'll just go through them. Um, the lack of direct access to a file system was something that made the developers feel a little bit like I'm not at home, I'm not safe here, what's going on? It was just a, an impression that they surfaced to us. Um, working with multiple cube config files that are constantly changing and merging is cumbersome. Um, this is something that we're actually working on with Podman Desktop. When you start, and I don't mean to pitch Podman Desktop, but when you start it, it looks for your cube config file. And we're looking at, you know, on the, the YAML complaint front, a way to just provide a nice GUI for working with your cube config rather than having to deal with the YAML. Um, despite SaaS vendors offering applications exclusively through Kubernetes or containers, um, vendor supported customers are deterred by its perceived complexity. So this is the case where, you know what, the, the company needs some tool, they don't know anything about Kubernetes. And the vendor tells them, well, you wanna run our tool, we're happy to, to help you, you have to set up Kubernetes and then we deploy it on top of that. So they're sort of like dragged into Kubernetes just by the sake of this tool they wanna run. So that's sort of, you have to think about this is the perspective they're coming into it, right? Um, Troubleshooting Kubernetes can feel overwhelming. That's the whole quote that I showed up front about <laughs> when it works, it's beautiful, but when something goes wrong, the pieces are all over the floor and I don't even know where to start. Um, any kind of guidance we can give users when it, we can clearly detect something happens, you know, at the point that it happens would be very reassuring and helpful to them. Um, and then just fragility in Kubernetes component interoperability, especially during upgrades, deploying platform level components like service, message, or service meshes provides challenges and risks. 
Um, you have dependencies, you have charts referencing older versions of the API. It's kind of difficult to navigate. Um, so our recommendations here, intuitive tools for editing Kubernetes configurations, um, at enhanced debugging tools to accommodate pods with multiple containers, avoid altering internal DNS config on Windows, reducing the need for admin access, and then simplifying Kubernetes pipeline for debugging um, would be nice. Okay, so we made a lot of complaints to you guys. We've, well, we didn't make the complaints. We're, we are advocating for the developers and platform engineers we talked about, okay? And it's great to come with a list of things. This needs fixing, this needs fixing, this needs fixing. But what about actually fixing it? So we'll just give you a quick little talk about Podman Desktop and how we took some of this research and put it into action. What I would love everybody in this room to do, wherever you, you integrate with the Kubernetes ecosystem, Think about the findings we had, think about the things that we surfaced to you, and think about, is this something that I can change about what I'm doing? Can I make this better? Is there some small patch I can write, or can I change the way I think about a thing to make this better? And then as a community, I think that we can tackle this, especially the YAML stuff. I mean, that seems pretty doable, right? But, oh my, yes. So, my lovely SEAL friends here would like to introduce you to Podman Desktop 1.8. This just came out yesterday, I believe. And we have new Kubernetes objects support. We have deployments. We have services. And we have ingress routes. So you can view these from the Podman Desktop UI. Podman Desktop, the thing about Podman Desktop is it's very developer-centric. So it kind of gives developers a view that's tooled to their interest and laid out in a way that is built for their workflows. So we're trying to expand that from local pods on Podman to, to showing Kubernetes stuff. And um, you can also, this is a feature that's been around for a while. You don't need 1.8 to do it, but you can create a kind cluster. You can create a mini cube cluster from within Podman desktop as well. And the workflow would be you set up pods locally, you have your application going, you're ready to go to Kubernetes, you create a kind cluster, you create a mini cube cluster, you push to that, you test, you iterate, and then when you're ready, you can push to an external cluster. So um, yeah, try it out, and that's what we got. Um, any questions? Please somebody ask a question, even if it's silly. What? Do we have a demo? The SEALs are demonstrating different Kubernetes objects. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the original Kubernetes meme that this came from, but it has been recreated with SEALs. No? Check. Okay. Uh, is there a way to connect to the API through OpenShift? through Podman Desktop? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, we have support for OpenShift, so if you wanted to push your pod to OpenShift, that's possible. Um, Stefan, are you in the audience? Can you take that one? <laughs> Can somebody get that man a mic? <laughs> I'm phoning a friend, guys. So uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> so you can effectively uh, connect to an OpenShift environment directly from, uh, from Podman Desktop, but you can also connect to any kind of Kubernetes environment through the APIs. So you can deploy there, uh, and you can see the different resources uh, that are running there uh, as well. I saw a hand up there before. Do you still have a question? Oh, really? <laughs> I, think, I think one thing about the logs would be interesting is in Docker Compose, you had this where it showed you all the containers when you do the logs. Whereas in Kubernetes, you have the issue that, well, it defaults to one container, but it's not inherent of which one it defaults to. That's one thing. And the other thing is that I don't work for Uber, but I know they have a tool where 
if a pod crashes, it generates a zip file of the logs before the crash and uploads that to their compute platform. If Kubernetes had a, singular, a, simple, like a similar concept, that would be super cool. Those are great ideas, yes. Please work on them. <laughs> I think we had one over there, yeah, right there. Thank you for the presentation. I think most of us are not in the um, UX um, knowledge department. If we were to reproduce your experience and your um, process in our companies, how would we go between gathering the information into some results? Do you have some process you can share with us? Sure. Do you want to hit on it a little bit, Connor, or do you want me to take it? Uh, I think he, I, yeah. Okay, I'll go back to, and I just want to say that like we, we are open source zealots at Red Hat, which shouldn't be a shocker to anyone. This is a screenshot of a tool called PenPot. It is an open source design tool that we can use as like a sticky note app. So a fancy pants UX designer will tell you this is an affinity mapping process. I'm just going to tell you, you basically, you, you, you interview, you can take the questions that we, we sent out. There's the QR code and the slides. I'm, I'm sure the slides will be available after the talk. And then you, you find some developers to talk to. You go through the questions. What we did is we did, um, we use Google Meet, and it does the auto transcribe function. And we went through the transcriptions after the fact. And it's, it's sort of a technique. It's called ethnography. It comes from the anthropology field, and I know I'm going way into too much detail here, but you go through the transcripts and you just pick out those nuggets of information that were really insightful. So what me and Connor did is we kind of split the transcripts, halvesies, and we each kind of reviewed the transcripts in detail, and any time that we saw something, oh yeah, that was insightful, oh wow, that was a good point, oh, maybe we should look more into that, we just made a sticky note. Um, and the sticky notes were sort of all over the place to start, and then once we had enough of them, we, we had, I don't, was it two, two hours, three hours? Yeah, it took a while. About three, I think. This was yeah. a big study. And like, like I said in the beginning, the developers were so into it that the meetings went much longer than we had planned. So we had a lot of data to work with. But we basically had a couple calls where we went through all the sticky notes and we just clustered them. And it's not like, it's not like a scientific, well, it is literally a scientific process. But you're basically reading through them and the ones that seem similar, you just physically place them next to each other. So we did that, we ended up having different clusters, and then we went through the clusters and came up with labels for them, and then Connor very helpfully organized them into columns. And you'll see like in this, like you'll see like we have cloud native mindset, workflow, networking. So we ended up with like a lot of subcategories, and what we ended up doing is clustering the subcategories into larger categories, and that is what we ended up with the seven categories of, of information that we came out with. So that, that's how we went through the process. And then once we went through each category, we kind of thought through. And it's interesting because these are listed not in any order. YAML was one of the ones that really popped up to the top. And it's reflected in the results where we had three actual YAML results that we felt were actionable. So does that help? Cool. Okay. Hello. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, for a bit of context, uh, I work at a company that delivers application platforms and we are, uh, yeah, I can attest to the challenges for delivering these application platforms for developers. Um, and I think some of the problems that we see as well is that even though we can try to make some of the problems observable through open telemetry, and curated uh, observability stacks and stuff like this. And it's even, it's hard for developers, at least for some of them, to, to actually uh, uh, provision these local setups so that the visibility or observability is the same on the local setup as in Kubernetes. So I, have you any experiences with sort of challenging that or uh, any recommendations for bridging that? I mean, it's, it's basically shifting left, right? You're trying to get the environment that the developer is working in as close to what the end production environment is going to be. And having the ability to have monitoring observability locally on their local cluster that is comparable to the actual production cluster is just going to make it so much easier. They're going to understand how it operates in, in the production easier. 
um, it's going to be more intuitive for them when they're trying to debug something. So 100%, I mean, I would say yes, that's a great recommendation is anything you can do to get their local cluster as close to production as possible, it will minimize a lot of those, those impedance issues. Thank you, that was very insightful. Hello. Uh, thank you for the awesome talk. Um, quite a few of these points really hit home. Uh, the one part that I wasn't really clear about is you were talking about user experience, but specifically are you talking about user interfaces or are you talking about the CLI? And at least for the CLI, like I feel like some of these issues like are not well known, but there are solutions like, you know, the plugins for kubectl, like kubectl neat that will take out all the crap out of your YAML and just give you like the, the specific things that you care about. Um, the other thing that I find is really useful for kubectl is doing a server-side apply with a dry run, and that will run you through all the validation checks and give you a lot of information about what's wrong. Um, but yeah, some of those things like, you know, networking and trying to trace every packet that goes through and, you know, what IP table rules touch it and, you know, why is it, you know, crashing. I'm totally with you on that. So I wasn't sure whether, you know, it makes sense to differentiate like, you know, our, is this on the CLI or is this on the UI and when it comes to UI, what kind of UIs and what kind of CLIs people do? Yeah, when we, when we say user experience, we mean the entire user experience, whether it's the CLI, whether it's some GUI, whether it's just going to the, a web page of a Kubernetes platform and starting from there, or going through the docs, it's just the entire experience. And I, I would say, hey, if the CLI has tooling to address some of the issues we surface, the developers aren't finding it. So that could be, does that mean maybe this feature in the CLI, we should look at surfacing it and some of the UI tools for developers? Does it mean we need to advertise it better? Does it mean maybe we should examine the layout of the CLI's verbs and, and commands and see maybe, maybe we should have a better way to make it more obvious that this functionality exists? Or maybe if we detect an error state, we suggest a specific verb for the command that could help and then that's how they learn, right? So there's a lot of ways you could take it, but definitely the user experience is complete end-to-end. -end. Thanks for the question. Um, so I was uh, looking up to see if there was a special interest group for this kind of stuff, and apparently there was a SIG usability at some point, and it was stopped. Um, but it seems like the room was full, so there's definitely demand for this. Is that something that might get started up again? Or maybe you would... <laughs> be interested in? Uh, if people want to talk about that, I'm around all week. Connor's here too. Yep. Come talk to us. We'll see. Thank you for pointing that out. We good? All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and your attention. Thank you.